The Bain Free Radio Hour. On the podcast, distant cannon fire heralds the coming of the Star Beast and an age of peace. No, wait, read that wrong. An age of Greece. The difficulty of cleaning up space station scratch ED. Plus, we continue our complete audiobook serialization of David Drake's The Sea Without a Shore. All right now. Welcome to the Bain Free Radio, our podcast. It's an honor to have you along. I'm Bain editor Tony Daniel. This time on the podcast, Bain consulting editor Factotum and editor of the year's best military and adventure SF host a discussion with John Ringo, Gary Poole, Casey Ezel, and Mike Massa, editors and authors of the great new anthology Black Tide Rising, which is full of stories set in John Ringo's Black Tide Rising series. This is John's science-based zombie apocalypse series that is more about the survival and defense of civilization than it is about uh, running away from zombies. In fact, people don't run away from zombies in Black Tide Rising. The characters usually run toward danger in order to save the hapless and unlucky. And yes, you did hear that right. After over three years and nearly 200 podcasts, we finally got Ringo in the Bain Free Radio Hour podcast. Hast thou seen the great white whale? Why, yes, we hast. And, of course, we also continue with the complete audiobook serialization of David Drake's The Sea Without a Shore. That's all coming up. Now here's the news. Wanted to tell you about the great free fiction and nonfiction at the Bain.com website this month. We have two excellent stories once again, for your reading pleasure. First, we have Wise Child, another wonderful and touching story, mostly from the point of view of an artificially intelligent spacecraft, by Sharon Lee and Steve Miller. They did a story like this last year that was very popular for the website. This story is set in the Leaden universe, of course, and it involves a secondary character from their upcoming Leaden universe novel, Alliance of Equals. So check that out. Also at Bain.com is a story by the winner of the Jim Bain Memorial Short Story Contest Award. In fact, this is the very story that won the award. It's called Dear Ami, and it's written by our award winner, Amy Ogden. This is a tense, action-packed, and touching tale set in a near future where the asteroid belt is being mined and the hardest and loneliest jobs are often handled by people who have escaped some pretty tough backgrounds and upbringings and are trying to help their families back home on Earth. And finally, we have some really fun and intriguing nonfiction by Bain author Dave Freer. Dave Freer is the author of the Dragon's Ring series, many books with Eric Flint, and a co-author of the Heirs of Alexandria series, as well as author of a great new young adult coming-of-age fantasy that's now out, Changeling's Island. But Dave is also a degreed ichthyologist, and he dives regularly in the waters around his home on Flinders Island, Australia. So who better than a science fiction and fantasy author and sea life expert to tell us about some of the extremely alien reproductive cycles of some of the very strange invertebrates of the ocean? It's a great piece, but trigger warning. In the article, Dave discusses turbularian copulation with hypodermic impregnation, which gives an entirely new level of meaning to the term penetrative sex. So if sea worm sex freaks you out, read the article and get freaked out, because it's that good. Wise Child by Sharon Lee and Steve Miller, Dear Ami by Amy Ogden, and Strange Sex, Alien Reproduction Through a Biologist Size, and What This Could Mean to Science Fiction, are all available to read for free at Bain.com. And then, in a month, they will migrate into the ebook collections Free Short Stories 2016 and Free Nonfiction 2016, which are perpetually available for download at Bain eBooks. This is part one of a two part roundtable discussion of Black Tide Rising, an anthology set in the universe of John Ringo's Black Tide Rising series. 
The anthology is edited by John Ringo and Gary Poole and includes stories by many authors, including Casey Ezel and Mike Massa, who are part of the roundtable discussion this time. Hey everybody, it's the Bain Free Radio Hour, and this is me, David Afsharirod, for an unprecedented third week in a row. Uh, we're going to be talking about Black Tide Rising. This is a just out a couple weeks ago, new anthology of stories set in the John Ringo Black Tide Rising uh, universe. And here to talk about it today, uh, we have uh, the co-editor of the anthology, Mr. Gary Poole. Uh, he has been in the entertainment and publishing industry for nearly 30 years. In addition to Black Tide Rising, he's worked with John Ringo on over a dozen novels and has adapted several of them into screenplays, all of which remain in development, so we'll uh, keep our fingers crossed for those. Uh, he is the managing editor of a successful alternative news weekly in Tennessee and spent years on radio as a talk show host and award-winning broadcast journalist. Uh, Gary, thanks so much for being here. No, no problem. Makes me sound almost important when you read my bio like that. <laughs> we try. Uh, we also have Casey Izell. Uh, she is an active duty USAF helicopter pilot. Uh, when not beating the air into submission, she writes military science fiction, science fiction, fantasy, and horror. Casey, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. Absolutely. We also have Mike Massa. He has lived a diverse and adventurous life, including stints as a Navy SEAL officer, an international investment banker, and an internet technologist. He is a university cybersecurity researcher, consulted by governments, Fortune 500 companies, and high net worth families on issues of privacy, resilience, and disaster recovery. He is, of course, also a writer, as evidenced by his being on the podcast today. Mike, thanks for coming on. Glad to be here and looking forward to it. And last but of course certainly not least, uh, we have the other co-editor of Black Tide Rising and the creator of the Black Tide Rising series, Mr. John Ringo. He is the New York Times best-selling author of the Black Tide Rising series as well as the Pulsing War series. In addition, he has written the Council War series and the nationally best-selling techno-thriller novels about Mike Harmon. He's collaborated with Travis S. Taylor on the Looking Glass series, as well as with fellow New York Times bestseller David Wibber on four novels. Uh, that's just a fraction of his output, but we only have so much time on these podcasts, so I had to cut it short. John Ringo, thanks for being on. Yeah, I'm not ADHD or anything. <laughs> <laughs> if you look up the word prolific in the dictionary, it says see John Ringo. Let me do okay. my intro on this. Okay. okay. The wonderful yeah. thing about this particular podcast is that the two most important people are the enlisted people. And <laughs> the officers have to just kind of sit there, right? <laughs> it's, it's the E4's revenge on the O3s. Yes, the E4s have taken over. It's the E4 mafia is in charge. Huh? So you're saying, John, that the O3s get to sit there while the E3, E4s do all the work? That's that sounds about right, Mike, don't you think? No, no, I mean... no. We made you do all the work. That's the wonder of it. <laughs> <laughs> we we assigned you guys a buzz, but yeah. <laughs> I thought you meant for the podcast itself. That's funny. I guess if you would just talk to us about the Black Tide Rising series, um, set it up for us. Um, note the sarcasm on my voice when I say this. I'm sure that this came out of your deep abiding love of zombie uh, stories. So, um, John Ringo, uh, take it away. <laughs> I have always hated the zombie genre. Um, and I think my hate reached a new level when I saw a certain movie with Will Smith in it. Um... <laughs> which was a horrible version of a uh, a, a decent novel, um, better novelette. Um, but uh, I've, I've always disliked the zombie genre. I, the main thing that I've disliked about the zombie genre is, you know, there's the whole thing about people looking forward to the zombie apocalypse. I'm not looking forward to the zombie apocalypse because I and all of my friends are competent, and all the competent people apparently die in the first two minutes. <laughs> yep. Uh, so two things. One, I went at it from the point of view of reasonably realistic science, um, and two, I went at it, went at it from the point of view of the people most likely to survive are the competent people, 
which is why it's not as popular as The Walking Dead. Um, <laughs> because <laughs> most people are most pe- any, most people who watch are not competent people, and they're like, "Oh yeah, that's totally what I do." None of that is totally what I do. Okay, <laughs> not a bit. <laughs> anyway. Yeah, right. So this is a um, is it, you know, in a way, it reminded me of uh, Larry Korea. I mean, his, kind of his thinking behind the Monster Hunter stuff is that great that quote, which I think is in the first book, or I mean, it's the little epigram. Is the uh, you see a bunch of zombies, I see a target rich environment, right? Um, so we definitely have competent people in the Black Tide Rising series. Um, and so, as you said, this is a, sort of a science fiction version. It's not supernatural. Uh, this is a, a virus that um, turns people essentially into zombies. And um, there's kind of a specific, uh, oh, gee, how do I put it, a pattern that it follows or path that it takes. Maybe you could um, talk about that a little bit, uh, how, it, how it is spread and how it affects the, the infected. Um, the, the effect of what's called the H7D3 virus, which is not, in fact, the way to name a, that particular virus, but we won't go there. Um, the effect of the H7D3 virus is to eliminate sentience and increase aggression. The other effect of it is uh, what's called, oh, God, I've, I've actually lost it, um, for medication. The, the word is formication, um, mm-hmm. which is a feeling of ants all over the skin as they're starting to lose their, their intelligence, um, which causes everybody to strip. There was a real reason for that. It was, not, uh, it was not for pornographic purposes. One of my problems with, with universes that uh, involve biological zombies, if you will, is that they, they still have to eat and they still have to excrete. And modern clothing would not break down before the people would die of uh, impact of bowel syndrome. Uh, so it was it was very specific so that they would be able to survive. That's actually discussed in the book. Um, so it's uh, at at that point, at a certain point, civilization civilization breaks down, and uh, the main characters have to try to figure out how to rebuild it at sea as. As, it, as occasionally joked, it becomes a bit Battlestar Galactica at sea in a zombie apocalypse. Right, right. Um, and th- and those are in the novels. And then this is a collection of short stories, uh, two of which were written by you, but the rest by other folks. Um, so how do these stories tie into the overall Black Tide Rising series? Um, or do they? Um, how directly do they tie in? I'm, I know the answer to this, but I'll let you tell the listeners, um, if you would. I'm going to kick that one to Gary. Basically, when the uh, when John asked me to uh, help put the anthology together, there are four books in the series, and they each take place, you know, further on in the timeline. So we decided with the first book, it would be tied into the beginning of the fir- of the you know the first anthology, be tied in the beginning of the first book. And it's mostly about the fall. Uh, you know, the fall of civilization as the infected take, you know, become more and more prevalent and more and more people get infected. And one of the whole things about Black Tide that I really like about the series is, yes, John does it again like he does in some of his other books. He kills off a huge percentage of humanity, but the people that survive are still working towards a future. They, they have not lost hope. It's not just survival for survival's sake. It's survival to a purpose. And it was just interesting to see what other writers, really good writers, could do in that science-based biological zombie apocalypse. A lot more common sense is what came out of it. A lot of the stories, uh, especially Mike Massa's story, do not have the classic Hollywood ending. Uh, They can be very dark, which is also, I think, very realistic. Uh, most people that watch zombie shows, they think to themselves, it's like watching NASCAR. Everybody watches NASCAR, they think they can drive that way because they have a car. No, you can't. Most people, <laughs> let's be honest, if there was an actual zombie apocalypse, you are going to die. However, there are people, regular people, that can do very smart, common sense things to survive. And I think that's what comes through in a whole lot of the stories. 
Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I think you touched on something that I was going to talk about later, but we can talk about it now. And we can, Gary, you can take this one. Then if anyone else wants to jump in as well, um, the, there's two, I said there's two John Ringo stories in here. And in the last one, um, uh, Steve Smith, uh, who is a character in the novels, uh, is in it. And he talks about, he says, uh, we weren't really concerned about saving the human species. We were pretty sure the species would make it. What we're concerned about is saving civilization. And I think that is one thing that all these stories do is that they, um, hit on that topic. And, um, I don't know, maybe you could just talk about that. Cause that was, that was something that was appealing to me. It's not, it was a, it, cause it made people think things through a little bit more, right? It's one thing to not die. It's another thing to keep however tattered it may become, uh, you know, the fabric of society, uh, together. Yeah. Um, one of the things that uh, Tony Weisskopf said about it was two of the main characters in there are Faith and Sophia. Sophia, of course, is Greek for wisdom. Um, so it's it's Faith and wisdom. Um, one of the things that Tony said was whether Faith or Sophia were in the scene, in every scene there was hope. It, mm-hmm. it really is. Uh, the stories take, I mean, each one is very, you know, it's different because You know, you're asking a writer to have their take on it, which is what I find fascinating about anthologies. And I'm very, very impressed with the quality and variety of the stories that we ended up with in the anthology, because everybody has a different take on it. And But it really does come through is that it's not just species survival. Let's face it, anybody that studies history knows that the human race has come close to being wiped out uh, several times in our history, but we always survive. The question is, how do you keep civilization, as you said, going? And everybody approaches it from a different standpoint. Some people band together. Some people uh, go to religion. Some people go to, what can I get out of this? Uh, one of the stories is about a very odd robbery of the loot. So everything <laughs> is different. And I really like that. I mean, that was what really interested it to me was just seeing you know, Eric Flint's story about a bunch of people in northern Indiana that decide a good place to survive is on top of a big oil tank. It made sense. Instead of, per se, not to mention any other shows or anything, locking yourselves up in a prison in North Georgia. Not probably a good idea. Yeah, that's uh, Eric's story, Up on the Roof, um, which is the, the second one in the in the anthology. And I'll, I'll just agree with you. I thought this was... Uh, really loved all the stories and thought it was just a great, uh, anthology. And the thing is, I, you know, I, they don't feel repetitive. Like you're saying, people have such varied takes on this because you'd think, okay, beginning of the zombie apocalypse in this one specific world, how many times can I read that? And the answer is, let me count the stories. One, two, however many stories are in there, right? They, they all take a very, um, different tack on things. Um, Speaking of which, maybe let's talk about a couple of them. Um, Mike, I mentioned uh, some of your background, and uh, I read your bio after I read your story, and then I go, aha! Um, so maybe your story is called Battle of the Burts. Maybe you could tell us what a Burt is, and uh, just kind of, for the listeners, set up your story to uh, to whet their appetite, make them want to crack open the book and, and take a look at that Mike Massa story. Sure. Well, the... Uh, the acronym BERT stands for Biological Emergency Response Team. And uh, as anybody who's a reader of the story will know, and without giving anything away, uh, the zombies themselves uh, hold the keys towards you know, a medical response um, because there aren't a lot of uh, lab animals left, and, and there wouldn't be enough in the whole world to make enough of the medicine that's needed. And so absent a, a strong or decisive or effective central government response, big businesses and wealthy people and organizations are going to find a solution. They're not going to wait around. And in this case, a really large multinational bank has decided on the urging of a, a member, senior member of their risk management staff to uh, take advantage of this resource. You know, our zombies are both a threat and a resource. And pretty soon, other people figure that out. And... Uh, like any resource that is in demand, there's going to be competitive pressures for it. And that sort of frames up the first half of the story. Yeah, and it as really we said, there's... back into the first book. 
I mean, when we um, talk about the biological emergency response teams, it's very specific to New York City, but it gives a different, once again, it's a different view because of Mike's experience with working in international banking. People wouldn't think about the banks being involved in something like this, but in the real world, those would be some of the companies that would be right on the front line, so to speak, responding to a zombie apocalypse. Uh, by, by way of background, and you know, a lot of these big organizations don't really re- regard their host nation governments as as honest partners. And I'll give you an example. If the big bank where I was, and I was there during the you may recall the swine flu in the in the 2009 2010 time frame. And one of the things that happened during that is a uh, an important and significant South Asian or Pacific region government. Upon learning that we had stocks of Tamiflu, you know, stocks that I was personally through my staff storing and keeping safe, um, elected to confiscate when we went to distribute them. That was a bit of a shock. And later on during the, the Fukushima response, uh, when we were preparing to evacuate a number of uh, banking personnel because of frankly morale issues, and at that time it looked like there was going to be a radioactive plume uh, uh, blanketing both Osaka and Tokyo, uh, so we had arranged for our own transport, basically a fleet of buses. And when we went to go do that, the host nation said, oh, thank you for those buses. We can sure use those. And so there was no evacuation. And so a a thoughtful risk manager for a really big organization, whether it be a pharmaceutical company or a bank or, you know, pick the flavor, is going to think about the host nation uh, police forces as both an ally and maybe a competitor, as well as the other organizations, other banks, other manufacturers are going to say, hey, you have some of that, I need some of that. And the less law and order there is, the more they're going to take sort of pragmatic action in their own best interest. What really yeah, fascinated think- me in your story, Mike, was when how you worked it in not just the banks, but the street gangs in New York that also got into the BERT process and the vaccine production process. Where did you come about thinking of that one? Because I thought that was fascinating. It, always the very beginning, yeah. I mean, I don't, John, if you, how much you want to uh, – uh, any potential spoiler alerts for, for future work. But suffice to say that uh, the NYPD, which is a, a very, very large, the biggest police department in the world, has relationships with what I'll call uh, non-traditional businesses because it's easier, and this is my opinion speaking, I doubt that NYPD would, would, uh, would countenance this statement, but it's a lot easier to work with one or two big organizations that handle, say, production, distribution, and, and organization than 30 or 40 squabbling fighting organizations that also leak their violence onto, you know, Manhattan and the Queens and the Bronx. So a pragmatic person, and bankers and government folks are very pragmatic, probably would come to some sort of living arrangement. And in my in my book, I took the liberty of making that much more plain. The, uh, the, the nature of the Burt's being very, very quickly uh, transitioned towards uh, – yeah, non-traditional business, uh, for one of a better, for using Mike's term, is, uh, was built into the universe. There were references to it you can catch in the first book. Um, one of the stories I didn't do was about a, an out of town BERT team that, uh, uh, sort of met the very, very minimal standards for a BERT team and, uh, got into the drug business. One of the reasons not to do it uh, is because Mike's story more or less replaces it. Um, but that, if you read the first book that was built in, by the way, the reason for the name Bert uh, actually refers to the evil Bert meme. <laughs> <laughs> because basically these guys are going around snatching, you know, people that are human beings. They They just simply have gone insane and turning him into a vaccine. Um, evil bird. <laughs> there you go. There's a little peek into uh, the writer's mind at work there for the listeners. Um, and, and Gary said this about Mike's story. It's got a, a chilling ending. I, it was, I, I really, it's, I won't say any more uh, about it, um, but it was beautiful though. I mean, it's chilling, but, you read it and you're like, oh, it literally took my breath away. It's a good one, yeah. Um, Casey, you're you just piped up, so uh, let's talk about your story for a moment. Not in vain. This is, um, I guess, right? It's the cover 
of the book. Um, uh, Kurt Miller, uh, who's done a lot of work with Bane, uh, did the, and all the previous Black Tide Rising did this one. And, uh, it's eye catching. Let's leave it at that. Or we can talk about it more if you'd like to. Uh, Casey? <laughs> sure. Yeah. So, uh, I, I'll, uh, I'll tell you about the story, but before I do that, here's a, uh, just a little side note. Um, I had, uh, uh, Gary sent me an email inviting me to participate in, um, in the anthology, which I, of course, uh, absolutely leapt at the chance to do, um, because, you know, I'm a new writer and, uh, um, you know, the, the opportunity to work on something so large, um, and, and to be honest, something of which I was already quite a big fan, um, you know, as John Ringo's Black Tide Rising series was, you know, was, I mean, it was, it was, a, uh, I don't know what the word is for it, but uh, certainly something not to be turned down. So, um, so I wrote this story and I submitted it. And, um, you know, this is my first time participating in an anthology of this, uh, of this size, really. Um, and so it took a long time. I expected that it would take, take a long time before I heard anything back as far as acceptance or not. Um, and I never actually did hear anything. What I did, Oops, how I found out that my story was accepted. <laughs> that's okay. No, this was even better, John. How I found out was that John on his Facebook page, um, released the cover art and I looked at it and I saw it. And, uh, and actually Chris Smith, who's another one of the co-authors saw it first and like tagged me about three times in the comments, like, Katie, you've got to come see this. <laughs> and I looked at it and I opened it up and I was like, Oh my gosh. Well, I, I actually said something much more profane than that, which is sort of par for the course for me, but I'm trying to clean it up for the benefit of your listeners. <laughs> but I, I read it and I was like, goodness. And, and I, and I sent John a message. I was like, John, are, are those my cheerleaders? Is that my exploding gas station? <laughs> and he, uh, to which he replied, uh, yes. And then did you honestly think we weren't going to capitalize on the idea of quote cheerleaders with guns unquote. So, so that's how I found out that I was accepted to the anthology. <laughs> I was going to ask you if, if you knew it was yours or if you were like, damn it, someone else beat me and they did a cheerleader story. So <laughs> <laughs> no, my, my ego wouldn't allow that. I had to think it was. Okay. Mine. <laughs> well, that's, that's good. That's a happier story that way. <laughs> to get the back no, it also had the exploding gas station. Obviously. Mm -hmm. Right, right, right. Yes. That, that was also the key. That was also the key. Yeah. Uh, given um, the backstory on the cover, I was uh, tasked with coming up with a cover idea. I'm working with Kurt, who I've known for a long time, and I'm a huge fan of his artwork. He's a fantastic artist. Um, looking through the submissions that we'd gotten in, looking for something that would really kind of just grab somebody's eye, which I always thought was the purpose of the book cover. And when I read Casey's story, you know, the first thing I thought of was, hey, cheerleaders with guns versus zombies. So I sent the story to Kurt and basically suggested, you know, something that looks kind of reminiscent of Charlie's Angels. And I was flying to a convention in Charlotte. I was checking my email while we were on the tarmac and he emails me the cover. And I was kind of like Casey. I was a little giddy because I'm like that perfect. It is one of my favorite covers. Because how can you go wrong with cheerleaders and guns versus zombies with big explosions? I mean, it, that's what better way to introduce people to the universe? <laughs> right. I think it it definitely uh, tips you up. Uh, uh, if you didn't weren't familiar already, it, it definitely uh, lets you know what you're in for with the book. Certainly. So, uh, Casey. <laughs> Oh no, I was just going to say so um the so the basis of my story is um it, essentially you know as John said the competent people are going to survive. So um the question that I had sometimes. to ask myself is sometimes right <laughs> sometimes um is that you know if if I as a as a self-proclaimed competent person had to survive this this scenario what would be about the most terrifying you know, thing to all uh, terrifying um, complication. And that would be, you know, t t in my mind, it was being responsible, not only for my own children, but for other people's children. Um, you know, I, I am a mom and I'm a loud and proud cheer mom. My eldest daughter is a competitive all-star cheerleader. So um, that's 
sort of what inspired the story is the idea of, you know, you have this group of young people, um, boys and girls, because believe it or not, there are boy cheerleaders. <laughs> and, uh, and, you know, this is a group that, that is very tightly knit. Um, they, they quite literally depend upon each other for their safety when they're performing together, um, because competitive, you know, in competitive cheer, these, these kids as young as six years old are taught to throw each other up in the air and catch each other and to, you know, lift each other up one and a half body lengths up to, um, into the air. And I've seen, I've seen girls as young as six sacrifice their own bodies to keep the flyer from hitting the ground. And that level of teamwork and commitment and self-sacrifice for the benefit of someone else is something that was also really inspiring to me. So the more I thought about this idea, it sort of developed into um, the scenario, which is the, the main character of the story is Mia. She's a cheerleading coach. She's returning from a competition in Colorado Springs to her home in Albuquerque when the quarantine goes down. And so she executes her bug out plan that she has put in place with her family, but she's bringing her team along with her and um, they've all been exposed. And um, what do they do? You know, how, how do they resolve that? So, Right. And uh, when you say that they've all been exposed, um, I don't think we talked about this. So uh, just because you're exposed to the virus doesn't necessarily mean you're going to go full zombie. Uh, you know, it might, kill you it might make you really sick and you'll be okay you might be immune to it or you might go full on and so there's in a lot of these stories and in yours there's this period where there's this like i'll keep it clean too oh crap um am i going to turn into a zombie or not and <laughs> and you just cut you know and everyone has to kind of wait and uh, wait and see and um you know and it's it's a pretty it's a pretty good chance you will but uh if you don't die um, it's a pretty pretty low chance you're going to be okay, but seventy um, percent of the people yeah. turned, thirty percent of the people didn't, basically. Right. Gotcha. gotcha. Um, this is Mike. Yeah. I'm loving how we're taking care, not to use profanity in reference to a zombie apocalypse, because I'm pretty sure if I saw my first real zombie, I wouldn't be saying, "Oh, Uli G, I think that's a shambler." <laughs> <laughs> It appears that this person is somewhat disaffected. <laughs> <laughs> that actually um, would make a really, really good story for the next Black Tide universe, which would be the the incredibly, you know, the person who most British are not that sort of polite anymore. But it's the person who has just sort of made themselves into a 1930s British personality dealing with the zombie apocalypse. <laughs> right. Some sort of like, yes, hipster that has modeled themselves on Jeeves uh, from the Wode House, you know. Um, Pretty hard to bite through tweed. I mean, a really good heavyweight <laughs> tweed suit would be a nice protection. Sure, sure. But where is he going to find his mustache, his mustache wax? I mean, you know. <laughs> These are the questions well, we have to answer. Can be made um, from any number of substances. Uh, <laughs> you really want us to answer that question, Casey? Because <laughs> we can. We can talk about paraffin. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, this is this is not actually a bad one. Uh, <laughs> there's a great source of uh, of body fat available in a post zombie apocalypse universe that you can you know harvest and boil down and turn into wax. Well, yeah, you just you just turn up the sleeves on the tweed. I mean, or turn up the mm -hmm. collar on the tweed and button it, um, as you would in a really hard rain, for example. But what would be the head right. covering? Uh, do you well, have already a have a Hamburg. Down. A, uh, yeah. oh, oh no, even better, um, a deer stalker cap and a, and a, and a cloak. There you <laughs> go. A cloak would be fantastic. A heavyweight wool cloak? Sherlock would survive. <laughs> Uh, well, how do I, how do I go up from here? Yeah, there is the story here. Yeah. When John Elise goes, Casey and I cosplayed as a, uh, in, uh, as a helo pilot and, uh, and crew with the appropriate flight gear and patches and so forth. And I'm thinking, Casey, we should go to Dragon Con in bunker gear. <laughs> if I, I could get a hold I of it. What, no, no. I want I the cheerleader outfit. Casey wears to Dragon Con, <laughs> yeah. John, you wouldn't like me in a cheerleader outfit. It, the, the whole beer midriff thing doesn't work for me. 
Well, considering the first time I met Casey was at a kilts and corsets party at Dragon Con, I think we'll just leave that to the imagination. That was part one of a two-part roundtable discussion of the Black Tide Rising Anthology, edited by John Ringo and Gary Poole. Part two of the roundtable discussion will be available next time on the podcast. Now we continue with our complete audiobook serialization of David Drake's The Sea Without a Shore. It seems Cinnabar's chief spymaster is a mother also, and her son is determined to search for treasure in the midst of a civil war. Who better to hold the boy's hand and to take the blows directed at him than Captain Daniel Leary, the Republic of Cinnabar Navy's troubleshooter, and his friend the cyberspy Adele Mundy? The only thing certain in the struggle for control of the mining planet Corsera is that the Rival parties are more dangerous to their own allies than to their opponents. Daniel and Adele face kidnappers, pirates, and a death squad, even before they can get to the real business of ending the war on Corsera and bringing their charge home, maybe along with ancient alien treasure. Now here is the next entry of David Drake's The Sea Without a Shore. Xenos on Cinnabar the shippers and merchants' treasury had become Adele's bank shortly after she had returned, returned from exile, to Zenos. It was the first time in her life that she'd had money of her own, a share of the prize money won by Lieutenant Daniel Leary for himself and his crews. Adele, much to her surprise, had been included in the share-out. As she and Tovera came up the sidewalk, the doorman smiled and opened the bronze grill door with a flourish. Very glad to see you again, Lady Mundy, he said. Adele hadn't entered the bank in several years. She had no call to. Had the doorman been warned to expect her, or was his visual memory really that good? She smiled, or at least almost smiled, as she gave the doorman a nod of response. Deirdre Leary was in her different way just as able as her brother, so both were probably true. Adele stepped into the lobby of dark wood, polished stone, and more bronze. She was sure that the shippers and merchants handled its affairs with state-of-the-art technology, but it made a point of looking quaintly old-fashioned. Comfortably old-fashioned, some people would say. For those who wanted more modern surroundings, there were other Leary Enterprises to accommodate them. Adele noted the significance of the fact that Deirdre, who was the managing partner of most of those enterprises, had chosen the shippers and merchants as her personal headquarters. The majority owner in all cases was almost certainly Corder Leary, the man who had wiped out the other members of Adele's branch of the Mundy family. If Adele had looked into the matter and found proof of that ownership, she might feel that she had to do something. She would never look. She wasn't interested in business. The teller's cages were to her right. On her left, across the lobby from them, was the manager's office and a conference room. There was also a door in the back wall, under a painting of two men clasping hands over a table. That door opened, and Deirdre Leary came out. Lady Mundy, a pleasure as always, she said. I appreciate you taking the time to see me on such short notice. Deirdre had dark red hair and a tightly lacquered expression. Though her features were similar to those of her younger brother, there was nothing of the friendly openness that Daniel projected. Deirdre stepped back, saying, Won't you and your servant come into my office? I'll wait in the lobby, said Tovera. Her voice was emotionless. After all, someone might come in to rob the bank. Just as you choose, Deirdre replied, equally deadpan. She closed the door behind herself and Adele. Adele sat on a carved wooden chair without being directed and took out her personal data unit. Whatever the purpose of this meeting, it was more than simply social. Adele's relationship with Daniel's sister was equivocal. Deirdre clearly had her brother's best interests at heart, to a greater degree than Daniel probably realized. She had done Adele herself many favors over the years that Adele had served with Daniel. 
That did not make Deirdre Adele's friend. It just meant that Adele felt a degree of obligation to the other woman, which she would willingly repay if circumstances permitted it. Deirdre was also her father's representative in matters of business. Adele owed Corder Leary a debt also. Because of her friendship with Daniel, she wasn't actively looking for an opportunity to pay it. But if she ever happened to come face to face with Speaker Leary, she would make every effort to shoot him twice through the eye. Daniel would understand, and Deirdre would certainly understand. Deirdre settled into the chair behind her desk. The room's furniture was of dark, carved wood with leather seats on the chairs and a leather pad framed by wood for the desktop. May I ask if you expect to be working on a major project in the next few months? I do not, said Adele. I'm waiting to die, she thought, which of course could be said of every waking moment of her life. In context, all that mattered was that nothing she was doing at present was of the least interest to anyone else, particularly to Mistress Sand. Because Deirdre waited instead of leaping in with a comment, Adele said, Daniel is relaxing at Bantry. He invited me to join him, but I wasn't raised to appreciate the delights of rural life. She smiled slightly. Fortunately, Daniel and I know one another well enough that I don't have to pretend interest in his offer to avoid offending him. At some point, probably very soon, judging from Daniel's past behavior, he will decide that he wants another command. I will expect to accompany him when he does. I see, Deirdre said. She tented her fingers before her on the black leather, then looked up to meet Adele's gaze squarely. She said, I'm being blackmailed over financial and political matters. I need someone to act for me in the affair. If you are willing to take on the problem, I will give you carte blanche to solve it. She made a dismissive gesture with her left hand and added, and of course pay you whatever fee you set. The fee was minor to both of them. To Deirdre because she controlled vast wealth, to Adele because she didn't care very much about money. Give me the background to the situation. Adele said quietly. She had considered the request thoroughly in her several seconds of delay. Her first impulse, as generally, had been to begin searching with her data unit. She smiled inwardly. It would have been difficult to get the information that way, though it would have been interesting to try. Deirdre nodded. A Pantelarian businessman named Arnaud, she said, has become a member the leading member of the Council of Twenty which rules Pantelleria since the planet regained independence following the Treaty of Amiens. Adele had noticed a minuscule hesitation before Deirdre began laying out the data. But it had been no more than Adele's pause before she decided to pursue the matter instead of walking straight out of the office, the bank, and Deirdre's life. There had been none of the usual maundering. This must remain secret, or you'll have to swear not to say anything about this or other such nonsense. Deirdre had asked for Adele's help. Adele had asked for information which she would need to provide that help. Nobody who knew Adele would have assumed that she would accept a proposition without learning the details, for anyone except Daniel Leary. At the beginning of the recent war, between Cinnabar and the Alliance, Arnaud owned a small repair yard, Deirdre continued. In the course of the war, and after Pantelleria had been annexed to the Alliance of Free Stars, Arnaud found outside investment to expand his yard and to construct ships of some size. Among the yard's projects were five or six destroyers, which operated as elements of the Alliance fleet in battle against the RCN. Deirdre grimaced and stared at her fingers again for a moment, then looked at Dell in the face again. I was the outside investor in Arnaud's yard, Deirdre said. That is, Bantry Holdings made the investment. She smiled wryly. It's been quite profitable for us, she said. Though peace will require some adjustments. I would have expected you, Adele said carefully, to have walked through a series of cutouts, which would make it impossible for the investment to be traced back to Bantry Holdings in a provable fashion. Then Adele shrugged. There could be allegations, she said. But there are always allegations. Your enemies will believe them. Your friends will pretend that they don't. Deirdre made a sour face. Under ordinary circumstances, she said, that would be true. 
though I'll admit that when I looked at the detailed records, I found that the security arrangements weren't as complete as I would have wished them. My primary concern, however, is that Counselor Arnault is the party threatening me. He probably can prove our close association during the war. I see, said Adele, because she suddenly did see. Please wait a moment. Deirdre had said that she was the blackmail victim, but in fact the information led to Bantry Holdings, which she now managed. At the time the initial investments were made, Deirdre could not have been more than ten or twelve years old. Corder Leary himself had been in charge. Adele felt her lips quirk into a smile. She had allowed herself to pretend that she could associate with the Leary family, but not with its patriarch, Speaker Leary, who had murdered her family. Reality had just forced its way to the front, as it had been certain to do unless Adele had died before that happened. She had two options. On reflection, she found herself unwilling to cut herself off from Daniel Leary and through him the RCN, the first real family Adele had known in her life. All right, Adele repeated. In for a soldi, in for a florin. What is Arnaud asking from you? She brought her data unit live and began searching, starting with the sailing directions for Pantelleria, published by Navy House. Whatever the specifics of the problem were, the more she knew about Pantelleria, the better off she would be. The Treaty of Amiens required that the parties, the Republic of Cinnabar and the Alliance of Free Stars, give up all territories captured during the course of the war, Deirdre said. There were balanced exceptions, but Pantelleria regained the independence it had lost 18 years earlier. Yes, said Adele to show that she was listening. Of course but it was a polite acknowledgement, and she had been raised to be courteous when that was possible. Pantelleria had six colony worlds, all of which were controlled by the Alliance during the war and which were returned to Pantelleria under the treaty, Deirdre said. One of them, Corsera, declared its independence from the home world. Adele refined her search while she listened. Deirdre continued. A number of Pantellarians who were closely associated with the Alliance regime fled to Corsera. The exiles control a great deal of wealth, even after their assets on Pantellaria have been expropriated. They've been helping to arm the rebels, the independence movement if you prefer. In addition, the former Alliance garrison on Corsera was locally recruited and remained on the planet. Adil continued to read her holographic display. Corsera held vast quantities of copper. The mining income was sufficient to sustain the rebellion indefinitely, unless Pantelleria was able to sustain a real blockade. That last seemed doubtful when the home world itself was disrupted by both the war and its recent change of government. Ah, said Adele. She looked past the hologram to Deirdre and quoted, The Pantellarian Council has appointed Hermann Arnaud as Commissioner Plenipotentiary of Corsera with full authority to return it to the beneficent control of the home world. I would say that Master Arnaud has chosen a difficult task. I am confident that he would agree with you, Deirdre said dryly. It affects me because whatever Arnaud's original expectation, he is now pinning his hopes on Cinnabar intervention as a signatory of the Treaty of Amiens, returning Corsera to Pantelleria as part of the status quo anti-provisions. Our legal department informs me that Arnaud's interpretation of the treaty language is open to question. Adele flicked her hand. It doesn't matter what lawyers say, she snapped. If we send troops, or ships more likely, the Alliance will certainly respond by supporting the pro-Alliance exiles. We'll be back in a state of full-scale war in six months, or more likely three. Yes, said Deirdre. My research bureau said within a year, but I accept your assessment. Renewed war would be even worse for my interests than being accused of supporting the alliance during the recent war. So I have decided not to comply with Arnaud's request, morality aside, of course. Of course, Adele said. She pursed her lips. Partly to give herself more time to analyze the options, she said, Could you have gotten Cinnabar support for the Pantellarians? Deirdre spread her fingers before her. She had chunky hands. Indeed, she might best be described as a chunky woman. She was no more a raving beauty than her brother was a conventionally handsome man. 
Not that Deirdre's looks mattered. From what Daniel said, she preferred professional companionship to amateurs. Professionals cost only money, which she had in abundance. There are a number of hardliners in the Senate who believe we should not have made peace with a tyrant Pora, as they call him, Deirdre said, smiling faintly. Senators who feel that guarantor Pora's behavior toward his citizens is a proper matter of concern for the Senate of the Republic of Cinnabar, and also, Deirdre turned her palms up. There are hardline or personally involved alliance citizens who certainly are funneling arms to the rebels. Of course, the galaxy's awash with surplus arms following the general demobilization after the treaty. Adele nodded agreement. Arms dealers were rarely concerned with the political complexion of potential buyers, so long as they could pay in hard currency. A campaign in the streets of Xenos, protesting alliance aggression, wouldn't be very expensive, Deirdre said. Combined with discussions with individual senators, discussions meant log rolling or simple bribery, which Speaker Leary would conduct, and very ably, too, based on his past performance. I think it might be possible, yes. Deirdre didn't bother to repeat that she had already decided against the option. Adele was pleased to deal with someone who assumed that the person she was speaking to could remember a statement made a few seconds earlier. If this matter were publicized, Deirdre went on, it would ruin my chance of getting into the Senate. There's almost no possibility that I would go to jail for treason or even be tried, however. I have always expected to enter the Senate at some point, but I can bear the disappointment. Adele looked at her. On the face of it, I can bear the disappointment was sneeringly ironic. But behind Deirdre's polished deadpan, Adele saw a hint that the disappointment would be real. There had been a Leary in the Senate for almost 700 years, and that, if not personal ambition, would hurt Deirdre. Daniel would make a terrible senator but he might feel that family honor compelled him to fill the seat that his father would vacate, upon death if not by retirement. How would you like to see the problem solved? Adele said. A mechanical voice would have held more emotion. Any solution which doesn't result in the ruin of the Leary family is acceptable, Deirdre said. I'm aware what may be involved in giving an agent of your caliber carte blanche. You think you understand, Adele thought, holding Deirdre's eyes. But perhaps she truly did. The Learys were a notably ruthless family. All right, said Adele. She shut down her data unit and got to her feet. She paused to slip the data unit into her pocket, then said, My help will be expensive. Do you speak for the Leary family or just for yourself? Deirdre cleared her throat. She remained in her chair. I must ask, she said, if your price will affect the physical safety of any member of my family. It will not, said Adele with a smile as hard as the muzzle of the pistol she always carried in the left pocket of her tunic. Deirdre stood and smiled in turn. In that case, she said, I accept your proposition. If my personal resources are insufficient to meet your fee, I will commit those of the Leary family. She walked around the desk and offered her hand. On my word as a Leary, she said. Adele shook Deirdre's hand. I know what the word of a Leary is worth, she said. She opened the door for herself and followed the waiting Tovera through the lobby. I have a good deal of planning to do, Adele thought. But first, I need to speak with Daniel. That was another entry in our complete audiobook serialization of The Sea Without a Shore by David Drake. And that's it for the podcast. Thanks to Audible.com, to David Afsharirad, and to podcast theme composer Ruth Judkowitz. And a gateway into the next reality where the heat death of the universe is just a song played by a heavy metal band that has an eternal guitar lead solo. Really, it's never-ending and tickets to the Leptis Magna Arena, where a cross-time crowd is gathered to cheer and roar for the gladiatorial triumph over a legion of zombies built of spit and rickety premises for John Ringo, Gary Poole, Casey Ezel, and Mike Massa. All editors and authors of Stories in the Black Tide Rising Anthology. 
Please join us next time here at the hammering heart of science fiction and fantasy. And keep reaching for the stars. <laughs> <laughs>